Abigail Zuckerman, and this is Growing Older with Gusto. Each episode, I interview people who are growing older in an inspiring way. Whether you're 30, 60, or 80 years of age, these interviews will help to conquer your fear of aging. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website at www.growingolderwithgusto.com. Hello. And welcome to this latest episode of Growing Older with Gusto. I'm your host, Gail Zergerman, and I love to bring inspiring and wisdom-bearing guests to you. Today, our guest is Dr. Michael Kogan, who's coming to us from Washington, D.C. He is currently involved as an epidemiologist with the U.S. Health and Human Services Department, and his involvement with children is passionate. He is currently directing the Child Health Epidemiology Office in Washington, D.C. He told me that and admitted to me that his perspective on aging has changed since he was in his 40s. Before that, he felt that people stopped listening to you once you turned 60, but now he understands that that's really not true. And even more amazing to him is the fact that his adult children want to travel and spend time with him. His hobbies have evolved as he's grown older with Gusto, and now he spends a lot of his free time cooking, writing children's stories, and is also involved in a lot of physical pursuits, which include hiking and long distance biking. But most importantly, so many interesting stories about his life to share with us. And he really appreciates all the miracles that go along with growing older with Gusto. So welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you so much for having me, Gil. I'm honored to be here. Oh, well, we're, we're so happy you could find the time for us. So wonderful. Um, your career as an epidemiologist really means that you've been heavily involved in the pandemic. And could you tell us what you've learned through this experience about people working in the field? Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, when you train as an epidemiologist, you go into the field probably because you're curious, you're dedicated to science, you're dedicated to public health, and you have, you want to get to the truth of the matter. You want to look at some of the underlying conditions. So in many ways, a pandemic is the time when a lot of it, all epidemiologists are going to be involved, particularly a novel pandemic where everything is by the name is brand new. So people often say, well, wait, that's different than the advice we got a few months ago. And that's because we're learning as, as you go. People have been working incredibly hard on this. You look at the science journals and every week and they've switched to many of the articles are about the pandemic. So we're learning new things every day. So how has working with the US Health and Human Services department informed your decision to want to go out and make the world a public place. I guess that kind of goes along with public service, but could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Sure. So, so I actually moved down here from Boston. And when I was in Boston, I worked at a university. I worked in the nonprofit sector and I worked at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And so after I graduated, after I got my doctorate, I thought I had the fortune to have different job opportunities. And so I gave it a lot of thought and we decided to move down here because it was a chance to work at a national level to have some theoretically larger influence on doing good for children in the United States. And the Department of Health and Human Services offers that opportunity. So let's talk a little bit more about some of the colorful chapters in your life so far. I know you said you had this experience with the drug war during the 80s in Colombia. Could you talk about that a little bit? What was that sure. like? And how did you end up there? Good question. I'm not sure myself. No, actually, I was working for a university up in Boston, and they had a, they had a contract to do international health work. I was the only person on the staff who spoke Spanish at the time. And so they said, well, you're going to be doing this project in Colombia. I was working on a preventive medicine curriculum and also an evidence-based competency curriculum. And so they said, your job is to go to Columbia and work with this organization on helping develop a cooperative uh, for nutrition. And so we didn't have the internet then. This was the early to mid eighties. And so I didn't know much about Columbia at the time or what was going on. So being the, being the innocent in the garden, I thought, wow, this will be great. I'll go down there, I'll hitchhike around and I'll see archeological sites. I'll go to colonial towns. So I was going from one archeological site and wanted to go to a town near the border with Ecuador. And I didn't know much. There wasn't much in the papers at the time about a drug war going on or that there were uh, guerrillas fighting the government. So I met somebody 
along the way and we got to the town and checked into the hotel and we started walking around the town. Next thing we knew, the Colombian army had appeared and they were pulling every man off the street. And so, including me. And so I was listening and found out that the rebels had come into town a week earlier and killed the mayor of the town. So they were looking for who could possibly have done it. And I said, well, I'm a professor in the United States. And they said, yeah, and so, and they said, passport, please. Like a dope, I had left my passport in the room. And so they held me there at bayonet point for most of a day. They wouldn't let my friend go back to the room to get my passport. And, you know, they threatened me with the usual stuff, jail and everything. And so finally, after a number of hours, they let my friend go back to the room, get the passport. And once I produced that, they finally let me go. Now, did you stay much longer after that incident or did that scare you enough to make you want to go back to the city? No, I was in my 20s. I wasn't scared of anything. So, no, I wanted to see I wanted to see the town. And then I also had to get back to Bogota eventually to, to start work. Wow. So how long were you there? Overall in Colombia for that job was about four to six weeks, as I remember. Yeah, so about a week or two. Was, was, did it meet your up with your expectations? Although, admittedly, you didn't have the internet, so maybe your expectations were somewhat muted. <laughs> oh, Colombia? Colombia in general is a fascinating place. Um, what makes outside of that incident, I met, I met wonderful people there. They were incredibly friendly. And um, the work I was doing felt useful. They were really interested to hear it. Um, there were a lot of wonderful sites that you didn't hear about. I mean, you would go to places and there wouldn't be crowds of people standing in line to watch them. You would go to a historic site and there'd be nobody there except you. I mean, some of the drawbacks were that to get from one place to another, one bus a day would come along and then you might have to wait for another seven or eight hours for another bus to come along. I mean, one time I was hitchhiking and a woman came out of her house and said, I should tell you this, that a gringo with a beard was killed right here last week. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, okay, where's the bus station? Thanks very much. <laughs> and you got out. And I got out, yeah. So let's talk now about your time you, you spent, you told me in Nova Scotia working at a bakery. How did that come about and what was that like? Well, powerful so, life. Well, <laughs> well, so after I finished my master's thesis, I thought to myself, what's the craziest thing I could do to celebrate? And two years earlier, two, three years earlier, I hitchhiked with a friend all around Canada and up to Alaska and through the Yukon and down to Mexico. But one thing we didn't do is get to one province. So when I thought about what's the craziest thing I could do, I thought, oh, hitchhike to Newfoundland. So the next day I put things in a backpack and started hitchhiking to Newfoundland, went up there, explored it, took the ferry back to Nova Scotia. A woman who was driving, I met on the ferry and she said, well, I'm going around Cape Breton Island, which is an island in the northern part of Nova Scotia. The next day, she said, well, let me, you know, do you want to come with me? So I said, yeah. So we went around Cape Breton Island and then she dropped me off in a little town called Antigonish. And I walked around and there was a sign in a little cafe that said, help wanted. Uh, hmm. Okay. So I walked in, started talking to him and I said, oh, I can cook and bake. She said, great. She said, we have a theater troupe coming to town because there was a university there and they were going to perform that night. She said, if you can, if you can do this for them tonight, you know, we'll keep you for a while. So I did and and things went pretty well. Of course, I called my house in Boston immediately to say, oh my God, give me my recipes right away. Can you tell them to me over the phone? So I did, the troop loved it, and I stayed and worked for a while and lived in the youth hostel. What was that like? Fun. What are the oh. people like there? Oh, wonderful. I mean, when I had hitchhiked earlier um, around Nova Scotia, like four or five years earlier, there wasn't one night that we actually slept in a tent. People would pick us up and, you know, say, hey, could, you can stay in our house. 
And of course, sadly, that would never happen these days. Now, you also talked a lot about to me earlier about your desire to bike extensively, particularly in Portugal. I think there's a special trail there that interests you. And so how do you how do your physical goals? And I know you have so many of them. How do those align with your life goals? Oh, that's a great question, Gail. I mean, I I played sports in high school and before that and just love physical activity. So I still work out every day. And so some of my goals, I for example, the trail in Portugal is called the Fisherman's Walk. And it's a trail that I saw that goes for about a hundred miles along the coast of southwest Portugal. And so I intend to do that perhaps probably after the pandemic. And and then I've done long distance biking. Pardon? Okay. And so are I've you going by yourself? Good question. I am looking for <laughs> a great travel partner. So if anybody in your audience is interested, you okay. know where to reach me. Okay. Very and, good. And I've done long distance biking around Nova Scotia and I biked from Pittsburgh back to DC along different trails and and parts of what's called the Great Trail in Canada that goes from the Atlantic to the Pacific. So one of my goals is also to bike a fair part of that when I have more time. Okay, and so how do these physical goals align with your other life goals that you have for yourself? Well, in terms of life goals, I mean, one would certainly be to remain as, as vital and active as I can. And I feel incredibly fortunate that I feel healthy most every day and want to maintain that because there's so much of the world to see. Let's talk a little bit about your um, ability, I, should, I would say, to work in isolated situations and how that's how you've encountered that in your life and what it means to you. I mean, to work in isolated situations would be the past year right. in that the pandemic. And that's been and that's really been interesting evolution because people on my staff, I think all of us felt like we had been hit with a, a 300 pound water balloon when the pandemic started. You were dealing with all kinds of issues, people being isolated from their parents. Um, I have a lot of people on my staff who have young children and they'd be exhausted. So you could see almost a haunted look in their eyes with the exhaustion. And so it's evolved over time and little by little it's become normalized. And so you know, sometimes when you're an epidemiologist, I tend to have a staff of more introverts than extroverts. Now, for those of us who are probably ambiverts, I have Zoom calls, but I also try to have a regular routine of walking with different partners or biking with different partners after work every day, just so I can have the in-person contact as well. That's good. So tell us about what has inspired you to want to help young women with STEM, which for those of you who don't know, stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. What was behind that inspiration? Well, the inspiration is twofold. One is I have mostly a female staff, so I've been invested since I became a, a director of this office to, to help people to foster their careers, particularly um, women or women, um, other people from underrepresented groups, because we do have systemic bias. You know, certain groups are paid less. Certain groups may not have the connection. Certain groups, um, you know, may not have the same opportunity. So I've helped dedicate that since the beginning. And then in the second instance, uh, my friend and neighbor has started a group that's dedicated to helping women achieve success in STEM. And she had, because of my training in epidemiology, she was bringing in people from different parts of the science world to help with that. So she asked me to work with that and to help them perhaps give lectures on how to do research, how to put together a proposal. And so it's been, it's all been very rewarding. And, you know, it goes back to a point that it's been a common thread throughout our uh, podcast episodes where people who are growing older with gusto have a purpose to their life. And it sounds like you have so many. So that's just another one to put in your bag. And that's very nice. That's great. So what would you say has been your biggest professional accomplishment so far? <laughs> I guess the interesting thing, Gail, is in the first half of my career, I mostly did research as well as to put together a national survey. When you do research, you don't know what's gonna happen. You think sometimes people think something comes out of research and it changes the world. It's often not the case. Science moves forward incrementally. And for example, one time I had the 
honor of our article being perhaps the lead one in the Journal of the American Medical Association on over-the-counter medication use for children. And we were, I was interviewed a lot, and I think it was going to be on one of the leads of CBS News, but it got bumped at the last minute because of something in the O.J. Simpson trial. And so then we had, again, we're incredibly fortunate to have another article in the Journal of the American Medical Association um, looking at continuity of care for young children and what happens if there, there are gaps in their health insurance. And we thought, oh, okay, same thing's going to happen. Everybody's going to be wanting to contact us and interview us. And actually, there was very little that happened. And I think partly it's because one could over understand easily over-the-counter medication use for young kids. But talking about periods without health insurance and then what happens to care for kids is a little hard. It's not as intuitively easy to understand. And so it wasn't picked up as much by the media. I thought, that's fine. I'm not doing it for the media. I'm doing it to, you know, highlight an area. But then about two years later, I got called from Senator, someone in Senator Ted Kennedy's office. And they said, we just want you to know that your article was talked about on the floor of the Senate wow. for the Children's Health Insurance Program. And we felt it was really important to help pass that. That's great. So, so I thought, you just never know where things are gonna go sometimes. What would you say is the biggest challenge to working with the health, health uh, as an epidemiologist in, in, the, in the US Health and Human Services Department? Um, and what I would say, let me, let me answer in a slightly different way. I, let me look at the talk about the last year for the pandemic okay. specifically, because, you know, I've seen the dedication for people. I've seen the long hours they're working. And in some ways, there have been two different crises going on at the same time. The obvious one is the pandemic. And the obvious one was right in front of our eyes, but people didn't recognize it as a major issue is health equity. And that was triggered by some of the things going on last summer. And so I guess some of the challenges is in where I work is putting together the funding priorities and realizing one has to change. But it's also a great opportunity to look at things on a national scale. For example, we do a national survey of children's health every year in the US to look at their health and well-being. It might be the largest one in the country. But now we have the opportunity to look and see what's happening to kids, what happened to children during the pandemic, what happened to their mental health, what happened to their health conditions, what happened to their health services. And in addition, at the same time, we're also struggling to, to look at health equity. And what can we do? So the past, for example, a lot of people have been talking about health equity. But if you're talking about health equity, if you really want to make progress, you have to think about how to measure it. So we've been starting to tackle the question of what is health equity for maternal and child health? How can we help that? So the opportunities are incredible, but some of the challenges are maybe lack of time, lack of staff, you know, sometimes changing a large ocean liner, you know, an ocean liner too. Right, turning it around, not easy. Yes, right. or, in the, or even steering it a few degrees. One last question. So how do you see your future unfolding? Future? Mm -hmm. What do you see for the future for yourself? Oh, myself. I thought you meant the world. Um, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. If I could see that, I'd be fabulously wealthy. Uh, for myself, I could see hopefully continuing to be very active with a large social circle, continuing to learn things, too. It's so important. I mean, during the pandemic, I've tried to take the time to own skills in American Sign Language or take classes in cooking online, but continuing to try to learn things and take courses. I would also see continuing to work. I mean, the world is not going to run out of issues the day I retire. So I want to continue to be involved in it. No matter what your age, you can always make a contribution. And it doesn't always have to be in a paid job. It can be however you think is best. You know, we all, I feel we all need to help the world be a better place. That's a wonderful note to end the conversation on. And uh, it sounds like you're doing just that. And, and we so appreciate you coming on today and, and sharing 
your uh, stories and, and all the things that you've learned so far and what keeps you going and growing with Gusto. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is, I'm again, truly honored that you asked me to be on the program. Thanks, thank you very much. Please subscribe to our channel and check out our website at www.growingolderwithgusto.com.